<laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Thomas McKean! <laughs> By the time I stumbled into Istanbul, my hair was down to my shoulders and my backpack weighed more than I did. I was 20 years old. I'd been drifting around Europe for a year, wide-eyed, but not always wide awake. The fact that I had not yet lost my passport, my wallet, or my traveler's checks was not due to any great organizational ability. It was due to dumb luck. What I didn't realize that balmy July afternoon was that my luck was about to run out. I'd been in Turkey three or four days when it dawned on me that I hadn't written my parents a letter in three or four months. So I sat down and I pulled out an aerogram. And for those of you who might not know, an aerogram is a very flimsy sheet of blue paper. And you write a letter on one side, and when you're done, you fold it up, lick the flaps, and it forms an envelope. And the point of it is, it weighs almost nothing, and it's a lot cheaper than a regular airmail letter. But you're warned on the outside, no enclosures permitted. So I finished my aerogram, I went off in search of a post office. I ended up in a very nondescript part of town, tourist-free, and the streets were lined with very ugly buildings, office buildings of, of gray and tan brick. No post office in sight. So I paused on a corner waiting for a light, and I noticed a man had stopped next to me. He was about 35, short black hair, very wiry looking, wearing a blue shirt and gray pants. So I asked him, where's the post office? No English. I tried it in French. No luck. So I pulled out my little aerogram and I held it up and then I shrugged like this. He, he paused for a minute. He pointed at me. He pointed at my aerogram. Then he smiled. And then he went. And I thought, what a nice man. And as we walked off quickly up the sidewalk, I thought, he's taking me to the post office. We walked a ways when he suddenly veered to the right. We passed through a double set of glass doors, through a vestibule adorned with tiny tiles, these brownish red tiles, the color of a scab, through a little hallway, and suddenly I was in a square room. It was brightly lit, had a high ceiling, the walls were a sickly yellow, and the ceiling sort of a half-hearted white. On one wall there was a Turkish flag, and on the other there was a portrait of Ataturk. Above us there were fluorescent lights hanging from metal rods. The only other thing in this otherwise bare room was a long, low table at which sat the largest man I've ever seen. I looked around me and I thought to myself, this is an odd post office. <laughs> and then I said, it must be a new one. They've just opened it. And they haven't had time yet to put stamp machines or tellers windows. At this point, my escort shoved me towards the man so I got a better look at him. He was sitting on a very low chair at the low table and as I mentioned, he was enormous. I would guess he weighed in at, at at least 350 pounds. He had a head that was twice the size of mine with a flat, hairless top. He looked up at me. He had big brown eyes, almond-shaped, liquid, heavy-lidded. Heavy and on another face, they might have almost been beautiful. He seemed incredibly thrilled to see me. He smiled from ear to ear. And I thought, first of all, I thought that was a long distance. And then I thought, I must be their first customer. <laughs> I bet I'm going to get extra good service. So he smiled some more, and I smiled at him. And then he put forth a, his right hand, this big, meaty hand. 
And at the last moment, I noticed it had half a thumb and three quarters of a finger. So I very gamely shook the near hand experience and withdrew my hand and he smiled at me some more and I smiled at him and he smiled back and I thought, this is going to be a really nice experience. This is a friendly post office. So I finally produced my little aerogram, held it up and, and shrugged, hopefully. I'll never know why, but at that point, everything changed. The expression in his eyes turned furious. The smile dropped from his face, and with his uh, five-fingered left hand, he grabbed my aerogram. And at the same moment, I was grabbed. And not just by the man who brought me, but when I'd been busy shaking hands, two other men had tiptoed into the room. Oddly enough, both were wearing blue shirts and gray pants. They dragged me away from the table and began hitting and punching me. Now, I had never been in a fight before. I was the kind of skinny kid who turned tail and ran. My father, who had grown up in England, had impressed upon me that no gentleman is ever rude except on purpose. So I figured if this was not the time to be rude, there was no such time. The only problem was my father had never taught me how to fight. So as I stood there in shock as I was being pummeled, I was trying to remember when you punch somebody, do you put your thumb over your fingers or <laughs> under your fingers? And I knew one was good and one was bad, but I had no clue which. So I had to choose an alternative plan. And here, I had three pieces of luck. Number one, I was a good bit taller than my three attackers. Number two, I was so scared that I had become angry. And number three, I was wearing very sturdy Swiss hiking boots, which were a gift from my father, so he, he did help out. So what I did was, I took a deep breath, and I began twirling around like a whirling dervish, and since I didn't know how to punch, I went like this. <laughs> and at the same time, I kicked like this with my good hiking boots. And I screamed like a banshee, which I will spare you. <laughs> now, I don't know why they were attacking me, because they, they were just hitting and punching, and it seemed just aimed to hurt. They weren't trying to grab my wallet. It didn't seem sexual in nature. It just seemed like an attack. But luckily, fear gave me strength. And my jabs and kicks hit home. And I remember the looks of complete consternation on their faces when this skinny little hippie kid morphed into a ninja fighter right before their eyes. <laughs> and I don't know who was more astonished when about two minutes later, I had knocked all three to the ground. Thank you. At that, <laughs> at that point, I ran over to the table and I found my large friend busily trying to paw open my little aerogram. And he was, ha he was having a hard time doing it because he only had about six and a half fingers. <laughs> so I said to him, give back my letter. And he looked up in utter astonishment to see me standing and his three cohorts on the floor. I said, give me back my letter. And he clutched it very tightly in his left hand. I tried to grab it, but he wouldn't let go. And I knew if I pulled any more, I would rip it. And I'm not even sure why this letter was so important to me. I don't know, maybe it symbolized my parents and safety and home, but I was determined to get that letter. I said, give me back my letter. And he shook his head. And at that point, I totally lost it. It was as though somebody else had taken control of my body. And the next thing I knew, and it was a very odd action for a vegetarian pacifist, <laughs> I had lifted, I put both my hands together to form one big fist with my thumbs safely out of the way. And I lifted them up above my head, just like that. And without thinking, I went down, whoomph, 
And I can tell you the sounds of two fists hitting a skull make a very revolting thud. And he was a good bit below me, so I had a lot of momentum. And as I mentioned, he had the flattest head I've ever seen. <laughs> and it got a little bit flatter, I'm afraid. Anyway, after I hit him, he looked up at me for just a second. And his eyes had this almost heartbreaking expression of disbelief and disappointment. Then he belched. <laughs> and then his eyes, that had looked so disappointed, rolled up beneath his lids, so all I could see was the white. Then he exhaled very deeply, and then, like a boulder falling off a mountain, his head went thumping down to the table, where it bounced up and down, up and down, up and down, and finally stopped bouncing. He didn't seem to be breathing. I thought maybe he was just unconscious. He made not a noise, even when his chin hit the table. He was utterly silent. Oh, fuck, I thought. I've murdered a fat man. <laughs> and what I did was I grabbed my precious aerogram and hightailed it to the door. I got out of the room, through the vestibule, but at the far end of the vestibule, that was where the glass doors opened inward. And that was where my three attackers had pulled themselves together, caught up with me, and resumed their hits and punches. I guess I had learned a little bit from my first experience. So this time, kind of rudely, I suppose, I kicked two of them right in the crotch. <laughs> and the third one I managed to shove to one side and I could just squeeze the glass door open, squeeze myself through it. I was back out on the sidewalk. I turned right, even though I'm left-handed, and started running. The three charged after me. I dashed down sidewalks. I leapt over cars. I ran through red lights. I circled around pedestrians. I don't know if I ran for 10 minutes or 60 minutes. I kept looking back, and there these three were, charging after me. Finally, I looked back, and I had lost them. I had also lost myself. I didn't know where in Istanbul I was. And I was so freaked out, I'd forgotten the name of this dusty, dank hostel where I was staying. And even if I'd remembered it, I was too scared to ask anybody for directions. I was convinced that by then I was a wanted man, that I would end up in a Turkish jail with a charge of murder. So what I did was just walk in ever-widening circles. Roughly four hours later, I saw a, a quarter moon rising over the minarets of the Blue Mosque, and I knew where I was. I put my collar up around my face, I tiptoed into my hostel, crawled into bed. After a sleepless night at dawn, I slipped out of Istanbul, never to return. Now, decades later, I still don't know what these men were after. I also don't know why I fought so fervently for my aerogram. If I had just left it there to be pawed by that man, I wouldn't have the memory of his expression after I had slugged him or hear the sound of his head bouncing up and down on the table. But if there's one thing to be learned from such an experience, and it's something I think of actually every day, I learned how quickly the veneer of civility can shatter. And the violence, inexplicable violence, is there beneath and also, frankly, what it had brought out in me. The other part of it, maybe the good part is, even for a vegetarian pacifist, I figure if worse comes to worst, and under Trump it just might, <laughs> I am surprisingly capable of taking care of myself. <laughs> if, if that's the kind of world I, I want to live in.
Now, by chance, I happen to have two friends who live in Istanbul, Aslihan and Ekman. And sometimes I have the idea of going to visit and taking one of them and going to a library and looking through newspaper archives to see what I can discover about that balmy day in July. Perhaps I'll discover that an upstanding Turk was unaccountably attacked by a crazed tourist. And I'll discover that although he was momentarily unconscious, he had just suffered a mild concussion, not a cerebral hemorrhage, and soon recovered. Because despite it all, I like to think of him sitting, sitting under a sun-warmed fig tree, playing with his grandchildren, alive and well. I like to think this, but I have my doubts. Thank you. <laughs>